Yeah, no, it's already on, or at least the speaker's already on. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, the speaker. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Great. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Okay. Also, is it a Oh, okay, and then if I turn this on, and then we'll do the, let me and try to switch this. Oh, yes. here we go. Same Oh, okay, cool. I was super confused. I was like, how am I plugging? You see? Wow. Oh, okay. oh nice. You see? Yeah. Finish me. Nero. <laughs> Oh, it's on the second floor, yes. Okay. It's so and, uh, share screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's great. Also, wow. also the long, long thing. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that's okay. I, I, I fidget too much of my whole stuff. And, uh, all right, good. All this technology. And unfortunately, I was delinquent and didn't bring, I normally bring like my, I don't use the laser pointer, but I have a clicker, I see. but I forgot it. So I am going to use a long mouse and just like it on the edge of the table, <laughs> which will work equivalently. Wow. All the technology. Okay. All right. Yeah, I told you he, he's the expert. Okay, very good. Yeah, now, now I understand. Okay, very good. All right, at least I don't have to, I'm lazy, so I don't have to walk back and forth and back and forth, so I'll just be clicking my mouse. Wow, cool setup. I see. Okay. So the PRL is this year? Uh, yeah, it, it took me from. I mean, we oh. put it out on archive last, like last December. Got it. Um, I mean, it just takes takes a year. Maybe not for some people, but for me, the pure house it takes a year. You know, Tony is not. Tony is discussing this case. <laughs> oh, okay. They're probably interfere. <laughs> trying to interfere lightly. Oh, oh. Or maybe they know. You can go in. Yeah, yeah, you would solve two problems at once. So yeah, yeah. Sure. Do you guys uh do you try to stick to an hour pretty good? Like not really. No. Okay. Yeah, so it's okay if you go over time yeah. a little bit. This, this, I think this runs like a hair on the shorter side. Like with no questions, this is probably like 45 minutes or something. Uh, uh, hopefully there are questions. I guess we're ready to start. Yeah. All right. Uh, so today we're very happy to have our future colleague, your future colleague, to, to give the seminar today. Uh, so he did the best trial record any colleague can do. So he got a PhD from Berkeley, and yeah. he did his first postdoc in Michigan. And he's going to do his second postdoc here in Minnesota in the fall. Today, he's going to tell us uh, directly detecting light dark matter. And you're holding a position from it, Indiana. Three yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were, we were already discussed it. Yeah. yeah. He, I was he, wondering he, what you meant by best try record, but now I know. Yeah. So it's just a humble self try. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he actually took my office from Berkeley, and yeah. he took also my office in uh, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of. I, I slightly, in a silly manner, want to yeah, talk to whoever I need to talk to to like get yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, great. So yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm I'm super excited about getting over here at the end of August, uh, and I'll be here like all week through like late Friday. So you know, say hi, and, and I love to chat with everyone. Um, good. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, directly detecting light dark matter um, entirely from sort of the theorist perspective. So really I'm gonna be showing you a couple like model building games that are relevant for, for uh, direct detection. Uh, it's work that I did with Gilly and Aaron uh, on, on this first paper. And then also in addition with uh, Prudby on the second simpler model that I'll tell you about. Okay. Oh, 
I did the Zoom thing, so I had to like click back onto the screen. All right, let's see. There, okay, now it's good. All right, so uh, I have to give you the compulsory dark matter slide because I'm talking about dark matter. Um, and you, you've seen the slide in variations, you know, a million times. So instead, I just wanted to highlight uh, one simple thing that we know about dark matter, one of, one of the sort of first key evidences for it, uh, which is that, oh, maybe this is not going to go, okay, further go slower, all right? So what I mean specifically is if you kind of look out uh, in some galaxy and you, and you compare the speeds of stars sort of closer in to the central mass of the galaxy and further out, uh, you, you just do sort of, you know, Newtonian mechanics and you expect that like once you get beyond most of the central mass of your galaxy, you should be going slow, right? But in fact, if you look at most galaxies, this is not the case. As you go further and further out, um, they tend to actually like sort of level off so that further out stars are actually going like similar. And this is weird, okay? And this is like something that was uh, uh, really first seen in galaxies specifically uh, all the way back in the 80s. So like Vera Rubin and collaborators were looking and measuring uh, uh, galaxy. Uh, uh, stars uh, going around in galaxies, and this is what they saw. So this I, I stole directly from their from their 1980 paper. Uh, on the vertical, we have like the velocity of these stars that they're looking at, and on the horizontal, you have the distance from the center. And each one of these different lines is a different galaxy that they measure. And the important thing here to note is that like as you go like I don't care about really the middle, but as you go like further and further out, uh, all these lines are not dropping like one over root r, but right they're like actually seemingly going kind of to some constant, and that's weird, okay? So there's a few different ways that you can try to explain this odd phenomena, all right? Uh, so one is um, perhaps uh, our, our two, of, two of our favorite folks, uh, Einstein and uh, Newton here, might have made a mistake, right? That, uh, in other words, uh, Newtonian gravity is, is not valid on galaxy scales for some reason. That That is one you know possibility, and this, this falls into sort of the, the Mon category of idea. Um, but if you suggest that, you know, you might be called a blasphemer, so maybe you don't want to. Is this yeah. the same picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is the level of customization you can expect from non-physics silliness, yeah. Uh, so, uh, good. So, so it, you know, if you say they made a mistake, then, all right, you wouldn't literally be called a blasphemer, but, but this is not uh, what we're going to assume today. Instead, what we're going to assume is that this is kind of the artistic picture, right? So, so in a typical galaxy, uh, here's all our visible matter, right? And then uh, 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 throughout the visible matter and much beyond uh, the visible matter, uh, all these galaxies are embedded in so-called dark matter halos that make up a large amount of the, uh, of the mass of those galaxies. And here it is. It's, it's not actually blue and visible like that, but anyways. Okay, and so for all of these pretty galaxies that we look at, uh, th this is what we find, right? For the, for the most part, all of these galaxies have this this missing matter, uh, this missing mass, which which we know of uh, as dark matter. Okay, so what do we know that's that's relevant for for our direct detection discussions today? So first of all, uh, we care that there's like lots of dark matter. So there's something like you know roughly five times the amount of ordinary matter. Uh, that, that that's how much dark matter is. So it's like very significant. And we know it's in galaxies, uh, uh, including ours. Uh, these are the two simple facts that you can glean just from this one uh, observational evidence for dark matter that I mentioned, uh, not to mention all the other ways that we know that dark matter should exist in lambda CDM. And so from these two uh, simple observations, you can kind of say, hey, maybe, you know, this stuff that's definitely in our galaxy and is an appreciable amount of the mass in our galaxy, maybe this stuff kind of like bumps into ordinary matter once in a blue moon. Um, we know it can't happen very much. Uh, this stuff is invisible, and and we've never really seen a bump, so it's not happening often. But maybe it happens, you know, very infrequently. All right. So this is the idea behind direct detection. The the, the simple sort of idea. All right. So let me give you like a lightning fast direct detection refresher from a total, you know, theorist, uh, non-experimentalist, not an expert perspective. So direct detection, the name of the game is your dark matter comes in and it hits some standard model target. In this case. Uh, today, I'm thinking about hydrophilic metals, so I'm going to focus solely on the possibility of scattering off uh, nuclei, but you could also scatter off electrons, and that's also interesting. Uh, so, so you come in, your dark matter comes in, hits this standard model thing, and goes off on its merry way. And what you do as a direct detection experimentalist is you try and look 
for uh, that nuclear kick or that nuclear recoil, and you do so in your very large uh, sort of whip detectors that are that are um, uh, on the order of several tons of target material that's like super super pure and way deep underground and like several stories tall and very impressive and cool. Okay, so that's what you do as a direct detection expert, and. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, uh, these, these uh, WIMP detectors to date have not seen any compelling positive signals or, you know, we would, I, I would be giving a different talk and we'd all probably be thinking about something very specific and different than, than you know, the huge dark matter landscape models. Um, so instead, what they do is they set uh, more and more compelling and competitive bounds on the sort of dark matter nucleon cross-section. Um, and so as of 2018, those kinds of cross sections were limited below like 10 to the minus 46 centimeters squared for sort of wimpy masses of like 10 G to 100 G. Okay. So this, this is sort of the, not quite the present state of the game, but uh, this, this is kind of like where direct detection is at. Okay. Oh, and I should say, uh, please, please interrupt me because I've said these words a million times and uh, I like the sound of my own voice, but it's a lot more fun to like just chat. So, yes, What's that? Spin independent. Yeah, spin independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's 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 a very very brief refresher. So uh, let's go to direct detection future. Right, this is what I uh, think about as a model builder. So what's the kind of future direct detection? There's sort of two obvious directions that you can go. Um, you could either consider trying to probe lighter dark matter masses, uh, or you could consider uh, going to a smaller cross section. Right. So let's talk about the latter first. So uh, th this is really a story uh, of sort of like full steam ahead uh, uh, when, when I sort of look at what experiments are doing, okay? So what do I mean by that? So like, okay, this, this plot that I took was from like 2018's Xenon result, okay? But then in 2021, Panda X put out like a leading competitive result, okay? And then uh, LZ put out a result not a year later uh, or just a year later, uh, which is now already getting below like 10 to the minus 47 centimeters squared. And then just a couple of days ago, although it's not quite as competitive as LZ, which I'm obligated to say because LZ is at Michigan, uh, Xenon Incon put out another result um, uh, just, I don't know, two days ago or something. All right. So, so this is what I mean by like sort of full steam ahead. These, these, these large Xenon based uh, experiments that are looking for WIMPs, they're getting larger and larger and they're going for longer and longer exposure times. And they're just going to keep on going, going down and down. All right. Uh, but this is the direction that at least currently I haven't thought too much about as far as model building is concerned. There are like very well motivated WIMP benchmarks that live uh, in this parameter space that they're probing um, and, and that justify and motivate these experiments. So uh, instead, what I want to think about is uh, really about going light, going to sub GB. That's what I mean by like light, dark matter, sub GB. Okay. So the challenge with trying to probe lighter dark matter masses is, uh, is very simple. Um, your recoil energy goes something like reduced mass squared. And so as you go to lighter and lighter dark matter masses, um, your, your reduced mass is basically just your dark matter mass. And so you're really quickly having lower and lower recoils uh, that, that, that you're kicking the nuclei, uh, but your, your detector threshold is, is set, right? It is what it is. And so you really quickly lose sensitivity um, and the way these experiments uh, try to make up for it is by the sort of Boltzmann tail of the dark matter distribution in our galaxy, but you know you can only get so far that way, and so they all lose sensitive sensitivity very quickly at lighter dark matter masses. So the punchline is, if you want to get to lighter masses, you need to do something different, uh, and this has also been a very very active area over the last uh, decade or so in the way of proposing new ideas and new sort of detective materials to try to become sensitive to light dark matter, all right? So like one of the first, uh, maybe not first, but anyways, one of, one of the sort of uh, older ideas that has been around for a few years at least is to, to use superfluid helium. Um, I'm just gonna show you a whole bunch of different ideas. I'm not an expert on any of these, but just to give you a sense of like, you know, ideas that people have been coming up with. So superfluid helium has been proposed to, to probe dark matter all the way down to MEB, as opposed to like the sort of five, six GV cutoff of normal WIMPs. So that's quite a bit lower in mass. Um, there have been ideas about using color center production in crystals, molecular excitations, using multiple channels, 
uh, and a whole bunch of uh, uh, different possible systems using silicon carbide, using diamond detectors, using multiphonons and diamond detectors, uh, using whatever this thing is. And sometimes there's someone in the audience who knows what that is, but I don't. Whatever it is, it's interesting for uh, detector material. All right. Uh, and, and many, many more. So I just selected a handful. Um, I selected this handful in particular because the future results slides that I'll show you will have some of these projected sensitivities on them. Okay. But there's like dozens and dozens of papers about, you know, new condensed matter systems that are interesting for having very low thresholds potentially that you could use to detect light dark matter. Okay. And uh, in terms yeah. of the time scale, do you know which one is uh, on a shorter time scale? Super clear together. That's the one that I would put my money on. Um, not only because there are, I think at this point, three named collaborations of experimentalists that like are like, we want to do superfluid helium, um, including like one which submitted some letter of interest to like uh, uh, Snowmass or whatever. But um, uh, our, our local direct detection expert in Michigan, uh, Bjorn Penning, um, is like on one of those superfluid heliums uh, in collaboration with a group at Berkeley. And they're actually like starting to do like R&D and stuff. I don't think they've secured like funding per se, but I know that they're starting to put like some time and effort towards like developing it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, a naive question. And what kind of interaction do you expect to uh, exist between the superfluid helium and the WIMPs? Uh, is it a, uh, some kind of electromagnetic interaction? No, or only group? group well, so uh, everything I'm going to tell you about today is just some scattering of nucleons fundamentally, but then how that appears in superfluid helium is some complicated matter of like what that translates into for like a phonon signal or something. And so, like, uh, like these, like all, all, all of these sort of proposals. They're written in a sort of particle physics language. In other words, like if I give you some model and I say dark matter couples to nucleons or electrons or whatever, and here's its cross section, those proposals and papers do the hard work of translating that into whatever the, whatever response their condensed matter system or superfluid helium is going to have to it. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, but, um, yeah, but you know, in, in principle, the interactions from Newtonian would be better, but okay, thanks. Yeah, but you know it's not electromagnetic, right? Yeah, it's, yes. it's, a, it's an interaction with it, it's said with the nucleon or even with the quarks in the nucleon. It's it's a strong interaction. No, no, it's, 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 not, it's some non-renormalizable interaction. It could be some extra interaction like beyond, it's beyond the standard model interaction. Uh-huh. Right. So you're gonna talk about the interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the punchline, the punchline of, of writing it in this language, though, is that each of these different condensed matter systems does something specific to that condensed matter system. But you want to normalize all of these to particle physics language because that's like what people speak. So like on the on the vertical here, like for the superfluid helium, that sigma n is like morally the same as the Wimp cross section that you saw from Xenon. But the two experiments are sensitive to like very different things happening in their materials right like yeah, in other another, words like another example you see the the panel middle on the right you see curves for different materials silicon germanium etc uh -huh. right but it's always plotting the cross section on a, a, on a neutron in that case I don't, um, these are all these are all uh, nucleon cross sections they assume equal equal couplings to protons and, and neutrons just not necessarily a good assumption but okay yeah uh, so you all you do the theorist calculates the cross section on a nucleon, and then depending on the experimental uh, setup, you have to translate that cross section onto whatever they're actually using, what kind of material they're using. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah. Uh, are you looking at neut like neutron uh, cross section as opposed to electron cross section just because that's what you're interested in? Or like I would think in these mass ranges, electron cross section would be easier to see. Yeah, good, perfect. So so yes and yes. So uh, yes, I'm looking at this because that's what I was interested in for model building. The main reason I was interested for model building here is because we don't have any models here. So thanks oh, for, okay. thanks for uh, alluding to this question. But to answer your other question, yes, if you have light dark matter, 
you might say, why don't we consider it scattering off electrons? But it's a very good idea because reduced mass, an electron is closer in mass to a light dark matter than 100 GV xenon nucleus. And so people do do that and, and direct detection experiments do look for uh, electron dark matter scattering. And those would be different sensitivities and maybe different ideas. Okay. okay. So this this is the point. This is this is why I wanted to consider hydrophilic and, and just scattering off nucleons because uh, I didn't really go in detail at all about what all these lines are. These are just projected sensitivities, whatever. But what all these plots have in common is none of them tell you like where's dark matter, where where's some simple you know thermal benchmark, dark matter that we oh we really want to go for this thermal target because it's so simple and blah blah blah. None of these plots have that. So a very natural question as sort of a theorist or a model builder is to look at all of these projected sensitivities and say, like, where, where is dark matter, right? Okay. And so uh, let me just uh, uh, quickly allude to some of the challenges as, as a model builder for, like, how dark matter could exist down here. Okay. So we sort of want, uh, uh, not sort of, we do want a realistic model of dark matter, by which I mean a basal known constraints and has a consistent cosmological history that I could actually tell you what it did. Uh, that has a large cross section, by which I just mean something on the order of you know, 10 to the minus 40 centimeter squared or something. It's not huge, but I want it to be seeable at these experiments. Okay. So to get this, we might need to employ like lighter mediators, uh, which are going to be coupled to nucleons because that's what all of these proposals are sensitive to. Um, already that, that should raise some like yellow flags at least because light thing coupled to nucleons is going to be constrained, all right? Uh, also light thing coupled to dark matter with any appreciable couplings uh, might again raise some sort of yellow flags if you're a model builder because you might be worried that dark matter might like over annihilate in the early universe if it's like coupled to this light thing. It might, it might like ruin its relic abundance, right? So these are like possible challenges. Uh, in my mind, the biggest uh, serious challenge, uh, pretty model independently, however, is uh, BBN, so Big Bang Nucleus Synthesis, right? So I can I can summarize why this is a problem in one figure that I stole uh, from my colleagues at Fermilab. So like Gordon and, and Sam put out this uh, this nice simple paper a few years back, but this is something that's been known for, for a long time. The punchline is if you have dark matter that's lighter than about 10 MeV, with any kind of cross section that you would care about for future direct detection, it's like super ruled out from BBN. Okay. Uh, and it depends on if you're dealing with like drug fermion dark matter or like complex scalar Majorana fermion or real scalar, uh, just because uh, you care about degrees of freedom. But you know, generically lighter than 10 MeV, lighter than few MeV-ish, and, and you should be very concerned that um, regardless of what you're doing. Or assuming about dark matter, if it had that cross section and it was that light, it would thermalize before BBN and 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 just provide too much energy density to the universe at the time of BBN, which is very sensitive to Hubble. Okay, so this is a pretty generic concern that you should have. All right, so you know perhaps the answer to uh, where is dark matter after we impose this uh, sort of BBN bound is like you know maybe it's not here, right? Like if I take this BBN BBN bound like very seriously, um, you know some of these proposals are just like totally post, unfortunately, right? And like this 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 looks like something that needs to be addressed. Some of these proposals are only care about you know heavier than ten MeV, but Mikkel effect might get us down to ten MeV in a in a few years time. So like e even even they have something that they need to address. Uh, okay, so you know maybe this is one possible answer, but of course that would be a really abysmal way to end a talk. The BBN bound, you need the dark matter to thermalize, right? So, yeah, you do. So, um, what cross section would just a cross section with nucleons? What cross section would thermalize them? Yeah, yeah. So it's it doesn't have to be big. So like this is super ballpark, but something like ten to the minus. Oh, okay. the that that was the actual cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this um, here, they were assuming a point interaction, so like a heavy mediator. If you have a light mediator, it's even worse, arguably, because then you could also produce a light mediator. So when they did this very like model independent thing, they just said, like, right. Why does it depend on the mediator? It shouldn't just depend on the cross section. It should just depend on the cross section. The statement is just that like if your if your mediator, which is generating the size of a cross section, is also light, 
that also could go into oh, oh, the, that also oh, could thermalize and be a problem. Right. right. So this is like the most optimistic where this cross section is being generated through a heavy thing that you maybe don't need to worry about being around in the bath at the time of EVN. Hmm. And and even still, um, you really don't need a big cross section. You so if I just take the number density of uh, I don't know of, of baryons uh, multiplied by this cross section, I'll get the Hubble rate. What you're saying, or this will be bigger than the Hubble, right? If you just take the cross section times, yeah, but the number density of a of a relativistic thingy or whatever, like not not quite, but like in, in other words, the the calculation that I would do is I would say assume assume a, a thermal abundance for the stuff roughly at BBN that is still on the Boltzmann tail, and then just ask the question if I have a two MeV real scalar at like temperatures to one MeV or whatever. Um, like what's its energy density, and it'll be more than allowed by N. I think that's equivalent to what you're saying. What you're saying is checking if it's thermalized. And I'm saying yeah, once it's once it's light enough and relativistic, yeah. The, well, I, I was asking about the thermal the condition for thermalization. So yeah, sorry, sorry. So, so, yeah, so just for the rate the, the rate of yeah. interactions and sigma. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you just hit yeah, and that must be where that horizontal line. Yeah, goes. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. When you say the mediator case is worse, is that that dotted line up there? Because that looks less uh, than... Oh, uh, I... Or maybe you mean the fact that the dotted I line... I don't remember worse. what that dotted line is. Uh, sorry, I do not remember what that dotted line is, but I was just making a statement that, um, yeah, this cross-section is independent of whether or not the mediator is around in the back. And if this cross-section is being generated through a light mediator, that presumably that could be an even worse situation and that there, there could just be more, more extra energy density in time. But I, I don't, yeah, I don't remember. I would have to say agree. And are we going to talk about what opens up this exclusion region? Yep, my two silly models. Those are the only ones that I know. <laughs> there, there's, the, there's nothing else that I am aware of that does this. That, anyways, that's the punchline. I only know two ways to do it, and I wrote both the papers. So good. So what are the two ways to do it? One, two. Okay. So there are two ways that you might be able to get around this constraint. Um, and there might be more. And uh, I would be very excited to, to chat with folks if you have other ideas. But there are only two ways that I know of currently. And there are two papers. So one way is to assume that you have a phase transition in the dark sector at a very low temperature. Um, it's a very weird setup. And, and I'll get to that first. The other way, which is a slightly simpler setup, but still makes some assumptions, is just to assume that you reheat at a very low temperature, quite close to BBN, and that your dark matter is produced via UV free set. Uh, these are the two ways that that, uh, that you can get around this BBN constraint and still have a large enough cross section to be directly detectable to dark matter lighter than 10 MeV or something. Okay, so these two plots are the punchline. You now like officially check out and take a nap. I'm gonna go into a few details of like these things. And please uh, pepper me with questions if you're interested, but th this is really the punchline. Okay, there's only two ways to do it that I know of. Um, if there are any other ways, it would be very interesting to write them down. Okay, good. All right, so let me now go through some basics of the model building game. So both of these models uh, have a couple simple ingredients in common. So I'll go over those simple ingredients in common, and then I'll go through uh, the, two, the two ideas one by one. So they're both gonna do UV freezing. All right, so just to review quickly for anyone uh, who hasn't thought about freeze-in or UV freeze-in, what does that look like? Uh, so on the vertical, I have the dark matter yield, which is like number density of dark matter over standard model entropy, which should be in that, okay? Uh, and on the horizontal, I have X, which is the mass of dark matter over the temperature. So larger X's is later times, lower temperatures. After you get past X of one, you're, you're becoming not non relativistic okay? So the normal whip story that you're perhaps most familiar with is in black here. That's the freeze out yield. So in that story, the dark matter just has the same as uh, the equilibrium abundance that you would expect it to have uh, because it's fully thermalized with the standard model bath. And it just follows the equilibrium abundance until after it's non-relativistic and quite non-relativistic, at which point it freezes out. And then it just follows that black trajectory, okay? And then, and, until the, the present day observed abundance. Um, freeze in story is different. Freeze in, uh, you don't have thermal dark matter. It's never thermalized. 
And so uh, freezing corresponds to either the blue or the red. Both of these are always below uh, uh, that equilibrium black curve. In the freezing story, what happens is that the process coupling the center model to the dark matter uh, is proceeding through either like really, really tiny couplings or a very heavy mediator, okay? And due to those tiny couplings or that super heavy mediator, uh, this process of annihilation is always much slower than Hubble. So you assume that there is no dark matter after inflation and then this process is very slow. And so you never thermalize it. Uh, in the IR freezing story, which is like normal freezing, um, like if you, if you think about freezing and this is like the normal story, you just have tiny couplings. And so you really, really gradually build up your dark matter abundance to the present observed value. In the UV freezing story, you instead have a heavy mediator, by which I mean it's heavier than T repeat. It's, it's heavier than the sort of uh, standard model back temperatures at the end of inflation. In that situation, you just produce all the dark matter uh, basically all at once, right at, right at reheating. Um, and, and that sort of scenario is the one that we're going to consider for both these models. Yeah. Uh, so typically the uh, equilibrium condition for the yield is uh, roughly one over G star. Mm -hmm. So why is it that it's so small? So that means that implies G star is like 10 to the four. Sorry, why is what so small? So uh, why freeze out? So mm -hmm. the initial equilibrium uh, volume should be around one over G star because it's the number density of the dark matter over the uh, entropy density. Oh, sorry, you're saying uh, so, that. Yeah, so I expect Y result to be for the one over a hundred. Oh, the scaling. Um, that is a good question. Which may think. Hmm. Yeah, so your state, yeah, yeah, that's a very simple statement. I uh, see. Perhaps the scaling is wrong. I just stole it from uh, from okay. friends. This is like the sort of UV freezing, the, the sort of first UV freezing paper. Uh huh. I'd be surprised if they accidentally got it wrong, but yeah, I agree. It should just be one over G star. Yeah. I guess you need to know what their definition of Y is. Uh, yeah, they might have a different definition of Y. And I should probably have known if, uh, if I'm stealing their plot. Uh, yeah, let me, okay. let me, let me. Check. We can we can just check. Okay. Yeah. But certainly, yeah, it should just be one. Uh, okay. Good. All right. So that's the lightning fast UV freeze and review, uh, or introduction if you've never seen it. The other simple basics that both of these models are going to have is the following. So I'm going to consider uh, some hydrophilic mediator phi, by which I mean it's just some new scalar that couples to nucleons, so that N is neutrons and protons, and couples to dark matter with some Yukawas. Okay. Uh, and then I can immediately just write down like what the relevant direct detection cross section is. It goes like coupling squared over mass of meteor to the fourth. And that mass of meteor to the fourth is going to be relevant for us. Okay, good. So with those simple basics out of the way, I can now uh, apologize profusely for yet another dark matter acronym. So hyper is this hyper dark matter idea stands for highly interactive particle relics, uh, which is, you know, another horrible acronym. Um, I always half apologize because we tried to get an acronym that sort of conveys like what it is. Uh, so this dark matter is supposed to have as large as feasibly possible cross sections because our goal was to see what we could do uh, in, in terms of pushing model building to have large cross sections for these future experiments. So in this sense, hypers are hyper like wimps or super wimpy. Okay, so, but it's still a somewhat cheesy acronym. All right, so what's the idea behind hypers? I can't tell you yet. I first have to answer this aside question. All right, so uh, in the hyper paper, we not only do this little model building game, but we also address this question, which is interesting in its own right. And feel free to ask about why this is interesting, but I won't get into it immediately. I want to understand what's the max cross section of sub-GB dark matter scattering off nucleons. Okay, I just want to ask this question and address it. There are good reasons why you need to know the answer to this, but let's just ask it quickly and, and get to it. So I start with this Lagrangian. Uh, the maximum cross section just means I need to understand something about what are the largest couplings that I can imagine, what's the smallest mediator mass that I can imagine, and if I can sort of estimate these like roughly and reasonably, then, then I'm golden. I have the answer to my question. So let's first understand what are the bounds on the nucleon coupling uh, uh, Yn as a function of the masses mediator. If you go to 
smaller nucleon couplings, but not too small. There's going to be some supernova bound that kicks in up to at least like 100 MeV ish scales, uh, just from uh, excess energy loss from producing these mediators. Likewise, there's a stellar bound for, for the same reason, uh, this time being uh, horizontal branch stars. Again, you're, you're producing too much of these uh, phi's. And finally, if you go to two large couplings, uh, then you can induce uh, kaon decays, which, which have been measured as of a couple of years ago. I think that's the most up-to-date measurement uh, from NA62. Uh, so this is the sort of constraint uh, constraints that appear on the nuclear coupling. And so you can just read off like very roughly like what you expect the largest coupling roughly to be and, and the sort of smallest mediator mass to be. It's like a border of 0.3 MeV and like a border of 10 to the minus five or so. Okay. So with those two parameters roughly estimated, we can just ask ourselves like what's the largest kind of coupling that dark matter could have to this light mediator. Uh, and for that, we can just look at sort of the usual bounds of dark matter self interactions. Um, I threw up this nice pretty plot from uh, Minaj and Sean and Hybo's paper, which just indicates that uh, over uh, uh, a bunch of scales, a bunch of velocities from like uh, dwarf galaxies all the way up to galaxy clusters, there is some hint that dark matter might have self interactions. Um, and you can see for different sort of dark matter uh, cross section over, over its mass, for different constant cross sections, you can, you can see where those lie. Uh, the rough constraint that we are going to assume uh, for this model is something like a Sunru squared per gram at this velocity. Um, this this is this will just be the input for our estimate of the maximum cross section. If you prefer that to be a little bit smaller, you know, by whatever factor of ten, you can rescale the the maximum accordingly. Okay. Wait, I yeah. actually have a question uh, on the, the nucleon cross section. Yeah. Uh, so the upper bound you said was coming from k on decays. Yeah. Is this in some sense model dependent? Like you have to know that the couple very of model different dependent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yes, thank you for asking. So this is very model dependent. Um, so we we wanted to get the kind of weakest bounds that we reasonably could expect because we really wanted to estimate again for questions that I haven't mentioned, but of, of separate interest. We really wanted to carefully and conservatively estimate what is the largest possible cross section I can imagine dark matter having. So uh we chose the UV completion for our binucleon coupling that we think gave the weakest bounds. So basically the punchline is depending on how you UV complete it, what really matters is how phi ends up coupling the tops and at what loop and when. And really it's the phi like TT book, TT bar coupling that you induce that enters into the sort of K on the K diagram. So that's what matters the most. But at what level you generate phi TT bar depends on if you fundamentally couple phi to like light quarks or all quark, if you couple it to like gluons, and then UV complete that through some coupling to like heavy quarks that are like new, you know, vector light quarks or whatever. Um, so yeah, it does depend on the model. If you could come up with a model that managed to finely tune away the top coupling, then you'd be able to uh, alleviate the K on the K now. But we tried, we tried like reasonable models and, and not permitting fine tuning. And, and this is sort of the best okay. that, that we could think of. Good. Okay. So with the simple sort of uh, estimates and assumptions, uh, I can immediately show you like what the sort of maximum cross section looks like. So just to orient the parameter space, I'm thinking about like sub pile mass dark matter all the way right down to like 50 kV or so. Um, and I'm thinking of cross sections that are of relevance for future direct detection, by which I mean all of these dash gray lines are like projected sensitivities from all those different experiment things that I showed you a few slides back, okay? Uh, and in, in sort of shady gray here is some CDEX bound that like currently exists, okay? So what is the maximum cross section? Oh, I can't even get to that because uh, these experiments are going full steam ahead. And so this CDEX bound is actually no longer the most relevant since we got this published in PRL like a couple seconds ago. Um, you guys here at Minnesota, among other folks, have been very, very busy. And so Super CDMS put out a bound, um, I don't know, uh, what is it, a month ago, I guess, uh, which is which is ever so slightly more constraining in this parameter space. So I have to have to put this nod to Minnesota folks here working hard. Okay, so with that, here's the maximum cross section. Roughly. So at like 50 kV dark matter masses, 
Uh, I don't think the cross section can be larger than roughly 10 to the minus 35 centimeters squared at like 100 MeV. I don't think it could be too much larger than like 10 to the minus 30 centimeters squared. So, um, okay. So th this is interesting for other reasons. Uh, one reason that it's interesting, which is trivial, is that all of these uh, proposals are sensitive to this maximum by many orders of magnitude. So that's a great scenario to check on these proposals that like they're sensitive to something in theory. Okay. All right, so with this question addressed, uh, I will end the aside and now tell you what Hypers does, all right, what this hyper dark matter does. So uh, we want to see if we can think of a dark matter model, which might have even such a large cross section, but with like a full cosmological history and understanding of like how the dark matter got generated, why it has a coupling, why it has a cross section, et cetera. Okay. All right, so as I already mentioned, uh, we're going to do UV freezing. So uh, at some early times when the universe is reheated, the dark matter relic abundance is set. And its abundance is set and depends on the sort of reheating temperature and the mass of the mediator. The mass of the mediator I have suggestively called M phi I as opposed to just M phi. And that's because at some later time, I'm going to assume that there's a phase transition of the dark sector such that the mass of this mediator drops like crazy. Right, this is weird, but let's assume it for now. It's going to drop like crazy. Uh, I, I'll just point you to some other um, interesting papers uh, where, where they're changing masses and, and doing wonky cool things. The reason we're going to have the mass of the mediator drop like crazy is because the direct detection cross section goes like one over the mass of the mediator to the pole. So if I can set the relic abundance early on, and then in some odd kind of way at a later time, uh, make the mediator mass drop a lot, then I can expect a much larger direct detection uh, signal today. And I'll again point you to some uh, interesting early work where they were also fiddling around with changing the interactions today. How much is it dropping? Like, is this going to be a long range force today? So, no, not long range. So, I mean, so the, the smallest this mass can be is the one MeV that I, or 0.3 MeV that I showed you. But 0.3 MeV is not, that's okay. still like heavy. Uh, but it's dropping from like, maybe a TeV initial mass. So the potential that sets it up in the dark sector is super finely tuned. Not to mention that like there's fine tuning for like the MeV scale to begin with, but like it's also fine tuned and that I have this weird late phase transition that drops the meteor mass like crazy. So it's super weird. It's not, there's no, there's no beautiful UV completion that like, uh, that I would expect that like motivates this. Um, okay, good. So if you do this, uh, there's going to be some like immediate red flags though, besides like ugly fine tuning and things, which is just like fundamentally and consistently, like if you have too large a cross section, which I showed you from like the BBN constraint, you should mess up. You should like ruin the relic abundance. You should be super ruled out by BBN. So these are these are the sort of red flags that I need to address. All right. So let's worry about messing up the relic abundance. Um, it turns out that messing up the are you yeah. going to say how the mass drops. No. <laughs> so I, I let me tell you, let me tell you some words which will be unsatisfactory. So the only picture that I have in mind for like how it happens is I have two other scalars besides phi in the dark sector. I do a two-step phase transition between those two sectors, those two scalars, where there's an initial large VEV in one field direction, it pivots into a large VEV in another direction. And for whatever reason, the mass of our phi is primarily tied to the VEV of this first scalar. That kind of two-step thing has been like explored carefully for like electric baryogenesis and like two Higgs doublet and this kind of stuff. So like I can point to like someone else's like careful numerics for electric scale stuff happening where like that contrived situation of like pivoting most of the VEV, but not all of it happens. But those are just words, and then someone else's model at electric scales. I don't have anything nice or pretty to, 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 yeah. I told you it was unsatisfactory. <laughs> it's not good. But uh, it, it, there, there is some picture for how you could maybe contrive, you know, a, a, a hobble together a, a dark scale or so to, to make this happen. But it's not, it's not going to be pretty. And it's going to have to be flat too, because we're doing a late phase transition and I don't want to dump too much stuff like before. The and are these masses going to be like technically natural? Like, well, no, some higher no, of course not. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, it, yeah, it, 
if you carefully build this sort of weird two-step thing, like a dark two Higgs doublet, and then you supersymmetrize it, and then you also explain why there's a coupling primarily to one scalar instead of the other for a light scalar phi, then there might exist uh, some technically natural, well, not technically natural, but like susified version of this dark material. But that's, it's going to be super. Yeah. If you had a symmetry restoration. Yeah, that's right. So if you had. Yeah, the problem is that we need a, we need a little mass. <laughs> no, but you start with a little mass and you couple it to something else that has a bed so that early on it has a big mass. Sure, sure. Yeah, restored. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. The symmetry gets restored and the additional mass yeah, goes away. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that definitely. Yeah, that could, if it has some other bare mass that we're putting in for, for the time being and then additionally has most of its mass being set by a broken case that gets restored. Yeah, that could definitely occur. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So BBN and relic abundance, how do you not mess it up? Um, it turns out that messing up the relic abundance is a much stronger constraint than BBN, because if you recall, the BBN constraint was just once you thermalize, you know you have too much, but thermalizing dark matter super messes up its relic abundance when its relic abundance has already been set. So this is a stronger condition than the BBN one that I showed you, okay? So we need to make sure that we don't change the relic abundance after we drop the mass of this mediator. That's hard because once you do that, all interactions with the standard model go up, right? So uh, we're dealing with the hadrophilic dark matter model. So we would be worried about dark matter annihilating to hadrons, right? So maybe we can avoid this if dark matter is light and if the temperature is low enough when this phase transition right. happens. The, the dark matter anyway was no, oh, it was heavier than, what was the mass of the dark matter? The mass is sub pi on for this reason, all the way yeah. down to like 50 kV. Okay, so but, sub pi on, okay. So then yeah, that's why I was plotting sub pi on. <laughs> But also because, again, like from, from the perspective of what can you do below the, like in the BBN region, BBN is like below 10 inch MEV. So you would also be interested for that reason. Okay. Um, you need to worry about the inverse, right? Hadrons annihilating dark matter uh, or even photons through loop induced couplings um, through, through hadron loops to, to your mediator phi. Uh, these you can also prevent again if the phase transition is sufficiently low that there's not really too many times around. Okay. Uh, however, you might say, okay, great. It, it, like just have a really low phase transition, just have light dark matter. You won't mess up the relic abundance. This is how you generically get around this, this sort of BBN concern. But there's this thing I alluded to at the very beginning, which is like, how do you model build large cross sections? If you have a light thing coupled to dark matter a lot, that might be a problem. That is a problem. So phi is light after the phase transition. It couples to dark matter a lot because we want to have a large cross section. Generically, these annihilations are going to be a problem, and you do have to like suppress them to make sure that uh, that they don't annihilate away your your dark matter relic abundance. Uh, for this reason, hypers are not always going to be able to achieve that maximum direct detection line that I estimated a couple slides back. Good. So with that, I can show you results. So here's the thing that I showed you before. Dash gray is all those future experiments that we're super excited about. The black is what I wanted to model build for if I could. Here's hypers, okay? All right, so everything in blue uh, is like valid hyperparameter space. In other words, you could point to a point there and I could have a concrete Lagrangian that I write down for you, which explains the relic abundance, avoids the BBN bound, avoids indirect detection bounds presently, obviously avoids direct detection because we're hoping to see it in the future, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, avoids all the, all the bounds on the light mediator that I, that I mentioned. Um, okay, and I won't go through like all the various kinks and stuff, but if you wanna know about it, I'm, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, it's just, uh, I'll, I'll just mention that this sort of boundary of this hyperspace was found by like choosing the couplings and the mass of the mediator as good as possible to evade all of these constraints that I just mentioned while still having the largest possible uh, direct detection cross section. Okay, so what did all this effort and like fine tuning and super assumptions buy us? Uh, well, um, at, at, at sufficiently high masses above like 14 MeV or so, um, you can actually have hypers that have this maximum cross section. It turns out this chi chi to phi phi annihilations is P wave suppressed. For that reason alone, at heavy enough dark matter masses, um, it, it, it becomes suppressed enough. 
uh, sort of for free. So that's cool. Um, also, a sort of 